My approach to art history is a little bit different than maybe uh, what's normally done out there. The conventional wisdom is that students really should memorize the names of artists, the dates of famous works of art, the names of paintings, and etc. And I don't really do that too much. I mean, there are certain paintings that students should certainly be aware of, like the persistence of memory in Salvador Dali, or maybe the Mona Lisa, or Picasso's Demoiselles de Avignon, because it's the first time in human history people were painted in a way other than how they looked uh, for expressive means. So I have probably five or six paintings I make my students familiar with, um, but really I have this different sort of approach that I think it's more important for students to understand and recognize genres of art and kind of how one relates to another because they use this in all of their other classes in school, this idea of visual classification. And that actually dives deeper into, um, you know, the ways of thinking. When you're just recalling something, that's sort of uh, the worst on Bloom's taxonomy. But when you can start to categorize things and make inferences, then we're diving deeper. So I've created um, this little flow chart to help my um, introductory students kind of figure out what schools of art um, belong to each other and how some things are related and then we can do some comparing and contrasting. And I have a more advanced version of this as well and I'll have some links in the description. But what I do here is I sort of looked at the schools of art and thought how can we break it down? How can we figure out what's sort of happening in the image and to categorize things. So we, we make it a game for my students and I break them into groups. So I'll have uh, boys against the girls or uh, freshmen against the, you know, the upperclassmen and all of those kinds of things. So we kind of have some fun with it. And um, they earn points uh, for their team that is then added on to their final exam. So we could take a piece by uh, Jackson Pollock and we can use the chart and this one will be very quick. So start here, is there a subject? Is there stuff you can recognize? No. Check the title and make sure there's no subject. Yes, there's no subject. So we know that this is abstract expressionism. So any work that kind of fits into that category is gonna be abstract expressionism. We could take Picasso's painting, Les Demoiselles de Avignon, and do the same thing. Is there a subject? Can you see stuff? Well, yes, there are five ladies there. Are people wearing togas? Um, no. Is there anything impossible, magical, or dreamlike happening? Not really. Is there a strong sense of emotion in the art, or do the colors, shapes, and textures help make that stronger? Or does it have a very unusual use of shape, form, and color, or texture that uh, hides the subject? And yes, we would say there is an unusual use of shape, uh, possibly form in this. That would be a yes. So do you see obvious geometric shapes or shattered images? Yes, so we go to cubism for this one. We look at Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali and we do the same thing. Certainly there is stuff we recognize. We don't see any togas. Is there anything impossible, magic, or dreamlike happening? Yes, so it's surrealism. As students do this more and more, they become more quick and don't need to use my flowchart anymore to kind of figure out what schools of art are. And then when they visit a museum, they can start to make inferences about the work they're seeing. So they can see work by a different uh, expressionist and sort of understand that there's going to be a relationship between the two artists. So this is a great way to kind of have them work beyond uh, what they would normally understand uh, and then make, make connections and uh, inferences. So we can look at something like this. Let's try it again. Is there a subject? Yes. Are people wearing togas? No. Is there something dreamlike? Nope. Is there an unusual use of shape or form? Nope. Uh, does the image include stuff from popular culture? No. Does it show very royal uh, or rich people playing and maybe being naughty? Yes. So we're into Rococo. So again, this is a great way to kind of introduce art history to students, turn it into a game, have them be able to make categorizations, and then they apply it outside of the art classroom. In 10 years, a student might not know that the name of this is The Swing by Fragonard uh, and that uh, it's Rococo. But once they kind of see this here and then see it elsewhere, they'll be able to start to make some connections. And I think this is more important than students memorizing particular pieces.